Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Colvin, and I'm the Public Programs Curator here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I am so excited to welcome you to our very first lecture in our 2021 Food for Thought series. Before we get started today, I have a few announcements I want to share with you. First, we are excited to introduce a new virtual series called Research Rundown, History and Genealogy How-To. In these programs, you will join our reference staff as they offer short tutorials on genealogy and archival research. Each program is going to live stream on the Archives Facebook and YouTube page. So right where you're watching right now, you can join us here and you'll be able to see it. But we're also going to archive them on our YouTube page after the presentation. The first one is going to be Monday, February 8th at 12 o'clock Central Time as Courtney Pinkard presents on the Freedmen Bureau records. I also wanna go ahead and invite you back again next month for our February Food for Thought. On Thursday, February 18th, Dr. Hillary Green will present Hallowed Grounds, Race, Slavery, and the University of Alabama. And just like today, that one is going to be a virtual Food for Thought. So you'll join us right back here for that February Food for Thought. On to today's program, I am so excited to introduce you to our speaker, Mike Fun. Mike Fun is a historian and author who has worked with several cultural heritage organizations in the Southeast. He currently serves as director of Historic Blakely State Park in Spanish Fort, Alabama. He is the author of several books, but today's presentation is based on his newest one, 14th Colony, The Forgotten Story of the Gulf South During America's Revolutionary Era, which is available in the archives online store. And we're gonna provide a link with, for you to be able to purchase it in the comments in just a second. So please join me in welcoming Mike Bunn. Let me get from here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity to share this with everybody. Uh, the book is, a, is, is something that uh, is, is a topic that I've been interested in in a long time. And I would dare say that probably like me, most of the people who, who are who are tuning in now to, to listen to this probably are, of course, aware that Alabama had a colonial history. We, most people who are interested in Alabama's past are aware that we had some French colonial Spanish time periods. Uh, but what I find that most people don't know, and I certainly was not well versed on when I first began the project, was how they all fit together. When, when were the French here? Why were they here? British and so on. And the more I kind of began looking at the story of the, the, the British years of, of Alabama's history, the more I realized there was a story unto itself there that had not really been told very often. And that was the, the origins of the book. I will say I title it 14th Colony because, to be blunt, it gets everybody's attention. Um, we are so well well trained in the in the in the knowledge of 13 original colonies founding the country. We know that number and we know its significance, and we know it to to the degree that sometimes we forget there was an America outside of those 13 colonies. So there were even other British colonies in North America that did not rebel. And so I've chosen to title it 14th Colony. I don't literally mean that West Florida was literally the 14th to be established because it was established at the exact same time as its sister colony, um, East Florida, was. Uh, but I, I do it to, to, to communicate that it, it is, at least in, the, in most of our understanding of, of uh, revolutionary era America history, it, it's something extra. It's something new, something different. So um, 14th Colony tells the story of this area, the Gulf Coast and, and Alabama's Gulf Coast, and of course, Gulf Coast area of several other states, as we'll discuss, um, discuss its role in America uh, during this, this colonial period. Um, and I just found it really intriguing that we do have a connection to that revolutionary era era history that people were kind of hazy about. And so that that's what this is all about. So in the next few minutes, I hope to give you an overview of some of the the, the main characteristics of, of what the colony was all about. Why was it established? Who lived here? What were they doing? What's its connection with this larger revolutionary, revolutionary uh, war era? 
and, and and what that means, what all of this means to to what came after, and what ultimately led to to, of course, the state of Alabama being developed. So I'll try to put all that in context for you as we move through this pretty quickly, and just give you some highlights of the colony. Um, first thing I, I want to start with is is just a basic understanding of why it, why it was founded, and it had everything to do with a war that was fought. Uh, really across the globe, seven years war is an international war, but it was not actually fought here. Really, really no major contests were being fought here, but this was an international war between European powers, France and its ally Spain on one side, Great Britain on the other. Uh, the upshot of the whole war, we won't go into all the story of the war, but the, the, the end, end result was that Great Britain was victorious. And as a consequence of its victory, it acquired uh, all the colonial holdings, uh, or France was forced to recede all of its colonial holdings in North America. So I've got a map on the screen there. You can see the that, that pink, sort of light orange uh, swath of uh, the North American continent there. That was, that was French territory prior to this war. 1763, in the Treaty of the Ends of War, France has to give all that up, and most of it became property of Great Britain, which is actually highlighted in yellow there. There's a before and after map. And then um, there are, of course, portions of it west of the Mississippi River that were ceded to France's ally, um, Spain. I mean, that, that became the colony, the Spanish colony of Louisiana. So France is eliminated from this, this region as a, as a world power, colonial power. And of course, we know that right here um, where I'm at in, in South Alabama and uh, the Mobile area, we know that was, that was really at one point the capital of French Louisiana. So it had a long French uh, heritage in this area. But the other portion of, of Britain's acquisition of, from the war came from Spain itself. When Spain, if you'll notice on the map, on the left you see Spain, their holdings represented in green before the war, and after the war you see the Florida, the Florida Peninsula. They were forced to cede that uh, due to their, their loss in the war to Great Britain. So Great Britain acquires a big stretch of territory on the Gulf Coast, and it's it's right here where we're talking about today. It, it had both French and, uh, and Spanish heritage, which is a little bit different. So you're going to establish colonies uh, in, in an area that had not one but two previous colonial um, uh, owners. And it's going to present a few challenges. Uh, and, and the British are immediately recognized if they're going to establish any sort of colonial enterprise here, they're going to have to divide it in some way because the area that they're dealing with is just enormous. This is an area, an era before we've got easy communications, good roads, uh, all that that would connect this this really wide, far-flung new province. And you'll see on the screen there a map of East and West Florida. And we're obviously going to be talking about West Florida today, but East Florida is everything from the Apalachicola River and what we know is the rest of the state of Florida and the Pennsylvania. The uh, peninsula today. On to the to the west of that though is a separate province, West Florida. East Florida was was had its capital at St. Augustine, which was an established colonial town. West Florida is going to have its uh, its capital in Pensacola, which was a, an established colonial town that of course had been a Spanish um, colony. And Mobile was the only other major city in this large expanse of territory at the time, or major European city, I should say. Um, and which had a French heritage. So that border, the borders of the colony are going to stretch all the way from the Mississippi River in the west, and they're going to go all along the Gulf Coast on the south, stretch to the Apalachicola River uh, in the east, and then they're going to go as far north as the 31st parallel. That was the line that the treaty ending the war indicated where the, where the colony would be bordered. Now, there's an interesting little thing that happens as soon as the, this written gets on the scene here that's going to impact uh, some things that happen later in, in Alabama's history. And I'm just going to mention it now. We'll come back to it at the end of the presentation. But they realized very quickly that that proclamation line of 1763 uh, could, could, with relative ease, be extended northward into the interior where all of these rivers that drain into Mobile Bay incorporate a little bit more of those river systems. And they could also take advantage of uh, some really prime 
opportunities for settlement and development on the Mississippi River in the Natchez region in those environs. And they advocated, let's move this border up uh, fairly quickly after they acquired the colony. And there were some, and so there was some thought that they might um, put it as far north as roughly where Birmingham is today. Uh, they ended up settling on establishing it, the northern border at the 32nd parallel of 28 minutes. Where that is, is where the Yazoo River uh, drains into the Mississippi, modern day Vicksburg, roughly. And so if you draw the line from that, from where that, that boundary, that northern boundary stretched, and you went uh, west to east, you would go through Vicksburg, Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, or the metropolitan area, on to Montgomery, and then on to Columbus, Georgia. So that that's the northern boundary that they moved this colony's uh, boundary to in 1764. Now we'll come back to that. The, the, the first thing that people are going to do, the British are going to do, is they're going to try to establish their own uh, uh, you know, military fortifications and, and, and authority and government in this, this colony. And the two primary settlements of, of any size that have been established by Europeans prior, of course, as I mentioned, Mobile and Pensacola. And Robert Farmer, who comes to take over in Mobile, when he arrives, uh, what's interesting is he actually has a, has a a document drawn up prior to his arrival to distribute to the citizens of the town, which we're only talking a few hundred people here. These are not major, major metropolitan areas at the time. But he had the document drawn up in French because he, he already knew that this was a former French colony. Uh, and, and what they were offering was that people who lived here uh, could stay if they took an oath of allegiance to Great Britain. If they wanted to move on, they would be allowed a certain amount of time to gather their belongings, make their way out. But Great Britain and its rules would apply um, going forward. And the biggest, that was one of the biggest problems. One of the other biggest problems was just establishing the government and those military fortifications. Now, there were fortifications here, uh, Fort Condi. Uh, we know about that in downtown Mobile. Uh, it was it was sort of a shadow of, of what it had been uh, in its heyday under the French, and it needed to be rebuilt. And frankly, that those uh, uh, duties and the fact that th they're taking over area that had a climate that if, if anybody's familiar with Alabama in the summer and fall, especially the Gulf Coast, you know, uh, it's not the easiest of places to be in the days before air conditioning. Uh, and it's not just the heat and humidity that's aggravating to them, but it's the storms. And it's the, the, the easy way that, the, that, that diseases like yellow fever spread. And so the colony from its very beginnings had a reputation for being an unhealthy place. One, one person uh, who came here actually called it a graveyard for Britons because it just seemed like the most oppressive environment. And it also seemed like it was on the very far edges of civilization to these people uh, and it was a quite a distance away from the other British colonies took a long time even by water to communicate to get around the foreign peninsula had no major roads no newspapers being published the major communities uh, Mobile and Pensacola were not all that far from each other but the major areas that are actually going to experience some growth on the Mississippi is considerably distant from the capital of Pensacola so there's a lot of reasons that that uh, the colony was not exactly uh, the plum uh, designation for a lot of the first people who were assigned here uh, to help develop this place. But I wanted to say all that to help you understand that they had a tremendous task in front of them and they knew it, they recognized it, they complained about it, but they did launch into it with some serious uh, commitment and they did the best they could to establish this place. They literally almost were building a colony from scratch. We had that colonial era heritage, uh, but neither Pensacola nor Mobile were a major, major community at the time, and, and there had been only limited expansion of those colonial enterprises beyond those city limits, and the British were really attempting to do something different on a much different scale, and, and they made some headway. Uh, they were not entirely successful, but it is a remarkable story. Uh, they did, this is the seal of the colony of British West Florida. They had a representative government uh, but one of the reasons that I say that that we probably don't know quite as much about West Florida as we do some other British colonies in North America is that that, that colonial government was not especially active. The, the 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 
representative government was composed of the governor and his council, his, his appointed council, which would serve as the upper house when they uh, called together the, uh, the entire assembly, the lower house was elected. The issue was that the governor didn't call them, didn't see the need to call them into session very often. When they did, be blunt, they, 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 they did a lot of petty bickering. Uh, so they did pass laws. They were a part of the colony, but they were never quite the, the vocal advocate of the people that some of the legislatures were in other colonies, which is one of several reasons that I think we don't know as much about them. We just don't have that, that record of, of really active debate with them taking a part in things. Uh, but they, when they did call the legislature into session, they, they had representatives from each of the major communities, Mobile and Pensacola, as I keep mentioning, were the primary two. There's others that would come online, smaller communities, Manshack up uh, on, on the, the western border. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And there's a small community outside of Pensacola called Campbelltown, which was a, a um, basically a colony for, for uh, French Protestants. They had set up, they're, they're encouraging immigration. They're allowing freedom of religion, which is one of the, 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 the things that ultimately persuade some of those former um, uh, French subjects to, to stay in the colony, the Mobile area. But the, but the, the, the government, the, the, the assembly, ends up passing only a, you know, 70 or 80 laws or so over the course of its existence. It's definitely a part of the story, but uh, as I mentioned, never, never quite as the, the, the central focal point of, of people's day-to-day -day lives that it might be in other places. Capital remained at Pensacola the whole time that the colony was in existence, 1760s to the early 1780s. Went through a series of governors, the first governor, George Johnstone. Uh, he, he had a definite vision for what the colony could be and should be, and uh, he did his best to implement it. And most of the governors who would follow him in various degrees are going to try to implement some of the things he called for. And some of these are not exactly uh, out of the box, unique ideas. There's some obvious things, but they're very difficult to do. He wanted to promote immigration, uh, develop a, a, a real system of defense, a reliable system of defense. He wanted to, to have good economic relations and, and strong trade alliances and military alliances with, with area uh, tribes uh, developed to the degree he could all the connections it had with neighboring uh, Louisiana, Spanish colony. All these are things that they realize are going to be necessary if the colony is going to thrive. And he tried that. Uh, and if you ever read anything about the time period, you will know that he, he failed in a lot of those because not because they weren't necessarily the ideas the colony needed to pursue, but because he seems to be or seemed to to have been utterly incapable of maintaining good relations with most of the people he worked. He came in conflict with everybody uh, a, after any period of time dealing with him. There was one instance where, uh, where his own guard at the, at the, at the Capitol at Fort at Pensacola had actually tried to lock him out and he was forced to scale the wall to get into his own quarters. And there was an observer said at that point, you could probably determine the general uh, esteem this gentleman has held with most of the people he's working with. So Johnstone is, is, has good ideas, but he's doing anything but promoting internal peace and harmony. The government in London uh, realizes this, removes him, and they go through a series of governors. One actually is here for a few months, makes some headway, and actually commits suicide. So it's an it's a unstable uh, situation to say the least until Governor Peter Chester arrives and he will serve for over a decade, the longest serving governor in West Florida. He'll be West Florida's leader until its its end uh, uh, under during its days of British control. Peter Chester was not university liked. He was not always successful in everything he did, but he, he did provide to the degree that the colony found it some stable leadership. It's much more to that story that we don't have time to get into, but I want to introduce you to the major leaders that we'll be dealing with. Uh, the primary foreign relations concern that Ch that Chester and the governors and the council are going to deal with throughout the time period is is really how to to best uh, develop trade relationships and alliances with the areas of Native Americans. You've got to remember that at any given point you're dealing with a European population in this colony that may range between two and five thousand people. It's not a heavily populated place. 
the Native Americans in the region, however, that are in these, these hinterlands that are adjacent to where they're trying to set up this colony or even within it, the Choctaws, the Creeks, they're dealing with populations that are 20, 30,000 each. So they vastly outnumber the, the British uh, colonists. And so keeping everybody in, in uh, friendly relations is a paramount concern, both economically and militarily. Long story short, there were some some uh, disturbances, but not not so much that they really impeded the growth of the colony. Uh, they they were uh, they did manage to keep uh, fairly friendly relationships, both because the Native Americans wanted the goods that the British uh, brought into trade, and the British needed the goods that the Native Americans had, the, the deer skins that they would export through West Florida's ports by the thousands every year were. Um, in some ways, I think I think Catherine Braun, uh, I, I, may, I may have stolen this from her, but I think that that it's described as sort of like the blue jeans of the day. These things were turned into leggings and hats and book bindings and gloves in Europe by the thousands. So it's a product very much in demand. And just at the time this colony is being established, these products are, are in great demand. And so it worked well for both the colonists and for the Native Americans for a brief, brief time, of course. There's a lot more complicated story behind all of that, uh, but I just want to focus on the, the actual establishment of the colony, what, what the British were going through and trying to establish it, looking at it from that perspective. Now, most of the settlers that they're attracting to this region are doing all the things that, even if you know not all that much about colonial era history, you probably suppose they were doing. They are growing corn, trying rice, Chickpeas are a big crop they're trying to grow in these plantations. They're herding cattle and hogs. They're trying to grow tobacco. The problem there being that it was a very lucrative market if you could get into it, but the, the quantity and the quality seemed to always be less on the Gulf Coast than what was being produced in places like the Chesapeake. So there's always some difficulty with that. They, they tried their best to get into indigo farming. Uh, if you know anything about that, it's a complicated process where you take a plant that's difficult to cultivate, you go through a series of processes, and you end up with this blue powder that can be used as a dye, which was in great demand in the world. But it was complicated, took a lot of labor, and there was some pretty stiff international competition. So although indigo was tried with some success, that, that was not the path to prosperity for most people. Your average farmer who is going to find some economic stability in some way, shape, or form, is probably going to involve part of their their uh, efforts in in timbering. You know, we've got huge, expansive stands of longleaf pine existed in this area at the time, and they're going to tap into them for everything from to making barrel staves to various sorts of construction for the, the lumber uh, to to uh, parts for ships and the, the the naval stores industry with pitch and tar and pine and the things they use to caulk up ships of the day. Um, it's not the type of enterprise that people are going to become fabulously wealthy, but there are a lot of people that type a great portion of their livelihood um, was actually derived from these industries. Uh, this is a map of a portion of the Mobile Tensaw Delta during the time. Um, and I like to show it because it, it, it illustrates that although this, this was not um, the most prosperous farming region in, in, in the country at the time, there were a lot of people that were attempting to establish farms in the region. And all those rectangles you see there um, are, are, are where various land land uh, holdings were. And, and most of them would have had some level of enterprise, whether it be an actual farm and a small, and a small farm, or it could have been a larger plantation. Sometimes would have been operated by an owner, with slaves on the property with a hired overseer and the owner may, may live in Mobile or Pensacola. Uh, we're a long way from the height of what we know as antebellum plantations, but this, this level of agricultural activity was beginning to take shape here. And the British were doing everything they can to encourage people to come and to do it because the land was very inexpensive, um, almost free for a lot of people. This is an image of the, of the uh, Krebs house over in Pascagoula, which if you know anything about that, that dates to the 1770s, it's probably a good representation of what some of the larger plantations in West Florida would look like. This is, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're generations away from the Gone with the Wind mansions. 
and, and plantations with, with 100 enslaved laborers, but you did have landowners that lived in a big house and, and uh, 10 slaves um, operating small scale plantations. This is where some of that really begins in earnest. The French had done some of that, but the British period is when in this area, in the Mobile area at least, it really, really picks up steam. Um, the area that is going to spend, going to see most of the growth in West Florida's days is actually further west, Mississippi River, the Natchez district, Natchez up to Vicksburg, some of the best land in the colony. And of course, it's on this major waterway that drains all of the half the continent. And uh, they, they even Governor Montford Brown described as the most charming prospect of the world. So the immigration that's going to come after a few years after it's established, most of the people are, are become very interested in those western boundaries and it starts to really grow um, a lot more so out in the, in the western border than it's growing around mobile and pensacola uh, most of your farms are look a little bit like what the image i have on the screen this was a this was a small farm on dolphin island a sketch of it was made about 1770 or so this was still called massacre island then which is what the first name for the island was it the the French have, have uh, once they discovered it, uh, but you know, th this is this is an area of, of relatively, at least as, in terms of what came later, relatively much more modest farms. But um, big time agricultural was was beginning to take shape in this region. Now, as the colony is growing, it's growing on the Mississippi River area. One of the the, the dreams the British had was to develop that Mississippi River corridor, but do it in a way that they could, if possible, completely avoid uh, having to ship anything through New Orleans. New Orleans, remember, was part of the Spanish colony of Louisiana. And the British discovered there's this little, little stream called the Iberville River or Iberville River that in the right conditions might yield itself to improvement into a canal that would then funnel things from the Mississippi into the Emmett River and from there into Lake Maurepas and from there through other waterways into Lake Pontchartrain and then on out to the Gulf, thereby possibly redirecting all that, that, that traffic on the Mississippi River without going through the woods. It sounds a little bit far-fetched, and it was because it was just an incredible amount of work and ended up being a boondoggle. But they tried their hardest to develop it. And that promise is one of the things that drew a lot of people there because they thought they might be able to tap into this, this trade. But they sunk a lot of effort over several years trying to dig a man-made ditch and improve this, this, this what is naturally just a little wet spot uh, into a major canal. And they were not successful, but they, they tried for several times. Um, the 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 population, after despite all the things I've just I've just explained, and the people are starting to come in, the numbers are not exactly awe inspiring. Uh, but we're talking about a non native population of about 2000, 1765. We've increased that to the grand total of 1775. There is growth. It's more than double the, the original population. But it's no boom. The, to the degree there ever was a boom, that's going to come during the Revolutionary War. Now, the war, and, and it's this colony's relationship to it is what really drew me into the topic to realize that this area had that uh, a heritage that associate, was associated with America's uh, development. We're, we're very familiar with, with the, the, the map of the war. And even if we don't know all the spots, we know that Yorktown and Lexington Lexington and Concord, and we know all these places are on the Atlantic coast generally. And there's some obviously some campaigns in the southern colonies, but down where we're at, it's it's usually just just off the map. You know, not, nothing happened. It, it was just sort of a, a British disputed possession down here. But the war did find this area in two major ways, and I want to get into those in just a second. But I also want to mention the fact that when when you know, the Continental Congress was founded was formed they they actually encouraged they, they invited west florida to take part in this and it politely declined as did east florida now in, in the lead up to the american revolution we know uh, a lot of a lot of the terminology will, will bring to mind some of the the unrest that was going on the intolerable acts and the stamp act and all these various things these things are happening west florida exists 
but West Florida is not really getting actively involved in them. Some is because the news takes a long time to filter there. Great bit of it is that they just see it as somebody else's problem because they're more concerned with day to day survival. And that's hard enough in this colony. But there's no forum for easy debate. There's no newspapers. There's no central large community where all these things are taking place. There's no regularly meeting legislative body where they can can uh, be involved in this process. The only act leading up to the American Revolution that seems to have caught the interest of the people as far as to any great degree is the Stamp Act, because that really affected everybody's pocketbook in some way. And even the attorney general of the colony openly questioned it. And it's this close as I've been able to find anywhere in the records where there was this active, open discussion, at least, of some of these principles that were being beginning to be discussed about self-government elsewhere in North America. And Governor George Johnstone, even in, in a letter he wrote, I got on the screen, said the, the, I, the spirit of what is there, meaning the Atlantic coast called liberty, has begun to infuse itself here. So there was some awareness of what was happening. They were not living under a rock. But um, as as uh, John Campbell observed, who's here when 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 war did break out, you didn't have exactly have a rush to arms. Uh, this colony is always labeled loyal because it did not rise up against Great Britain, but it was not an enthusiastic loyalty where people rushed to arms. You read the the correspondence, you see what happened, and you get the impression most of them just sort of thought it was somebody else's fight. And if it came in their neighborhood, they wanted to see what the best position to take was for themselves. There were certainly some very, very uh, pro-British loyalists here, but they were few and far between. Most of the people were just trying to make a living. Um, now, the British government saw this situation um, and they were happy to have any colony that was not an open rebellion. And uh, Earl Dartmouth actually declared West Florida to be a secure asylum. Uh, for persecuted loyals elsewhere. So he's, he's going to encourage, actively encourage people to move here to, uh, to give them a safe place and to actually build up the colony of West Florida. And that's when, to the degree you had any rush to West Florida, you had it in land, as you can see on the screen, really easy to get. And the small fees that you were supposed to pay for it could easily be delayed or commuted to a later time. So you could have hundreds of acres of lands for pennies on the acre in the short term, and a lot of people took advantage of that, and a lot of people ended up moving to the Mississippi River area, especially uh, during that time. Now, the war, as I mentioned, is going to find the, the colony in two ways. The first is through uh, a direct action of the rebel army. Um, there, was, or there, there were some debates in the Continental Congress about whether or not they should open up a new front in the war and actually come down and seize West Florida because they wanted those ports that connected all those major rivers into the interior. Uh, and, and you probably don't have to know a whole lot about Revolutionary War history to know that was a no-go for most of the people who were struggling to protect the ports they already had in the colonies that were in active rebellion. And so that, that ended up being something that never really got very far. But there was a gentleman named James Willie who had lived in the colony previously. He had some friends in Pennsylvania, and he was able to secure a commission to raise a small force, go down the Mississippi River, ostensibly to help secure the neutrality of this region, which was already about as neutral as they could be. Uh, but he, he was supposed to secure the neutrality of, of the folks in the region and at the same time open up a regular route of communication between the Spanish and the American armies because the Spanish were already um, covertly, kind of clandestinely lending support to America, not because they were really anxious to see an independent United States because they were still colonial power too, but they wanted to do anything they could to hurt Great Britain. And so those were the, 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 the conditions that he had. Now, what he ended up doing was basically a campaign of just outright plunder. He, he just stopped and robbed and pillaged and took what he wanted because he knew once he got to New Orleans, he could probably sell it for gain. Uh, and the Spanish were not going to do much, but they were going to look the other way. And that's exactly, in a nutshell, what happened. As I said, there's a lot more to those stories, but in a nutshell, that's what happened. And the upshot was that Britain learned two things. They learned that their colony was extraordinarily unprotected, and they needed to take efforts to do so because Willing 
and his little band of marauders had caused a great deal of frustration on this western frontier, but almost before the British knew what to do about it. And they also realized that Spain, they already had some some tense relations that were building with the Spanish in Louisiana, and they realized that the Spanish were going to actively work to undermine them if given the opportunity. And everybody at this point, 1779, was aware that the British, the, the uh, excuse me, the Spanish were at least considering joining the war in some way. France was already involved. They're allied to the United States. France and Spain are still allied. And everybody knows that half of Florida was taken from the Spanish. And so they're concerned about development of, of, of escalating tensions in the area, not between Americans and the British, but between the Spanish and the British. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, governor Bernardo de Galvez, uh, who's governor of the colony over New Orleans, he knows his home government is considering um, aiding the French, at least in the war. And he's already has people, and including himself, who are doing everything they can to, to help the Americans at the expense of the British. He's He plans for a surprise attack should a rupture come. And he's informed that this, this might be coming in the summer of 1779. He, so he already gathers an army and has plans laid out and scouts out the area. And as soon as war is declared in August of 1779, uh, by Spain declares war on Great Britain, uh, he's prepared with a military operation and he launches it immediately. And he, he, he marches from New Orleans uh, goes up, captures the small fortification called Fort Butte, then he goes up to Baton Rouge, and after several days' fight, when he uses a little bit of trickery to convince the British attack is coming from one direction and the truth that came from another, he forces the surrender of that fortification, pretty substantial one. And in the in the um, uh, agreement ending the uh, that that fight he forced the the british commander to also throw in the surrender of the fort at natchez which is 200 miles or 150 miles up river uh and you can imagine the surprise at natchez to learn their their fortification had been surrendered and they had not seen the spanish soldier yet but in a matter of weeks um galvez had truly gotten the jump on the british and the entire western border of west florida had now come under spanish possession. And Galvez is not going to stop. Uh, he, he's, he's now fully launched into a campaign to take over this colony by force. And so he immediately raises another army, uh, a pretty diverse one. As you'll see on the screen, he's going to next target the, the, the next major series of fortifications in the colony, which is here at Mobile. And he, he, he arrives in Mobile early in uh, 1780. He, uh, he's headed towards that's just a map of Mobile at the time. He's headed towards uh, the town. He's going to go up the bay, drag his cannon and all his equipment into position. And he wants to lay siege to this place, try to reduce it. He, he first obviously gets into Mobile Bay by, by Fort, uh, Mobile Point where Fort Morgan stands and actually puts a small fortification there. And uh, it's going to take him some time, several weeks to get everything in position. And he gets everything there and they begin this siege and it's day and all, you know, everyday skirmishing for some period of time while they get these huge pieces of artillery positioned so they can open a bombardment on the fort. He offers, he, he, he asks uh, the commander at the fort to surrender and, and uh, Durnford, you know, uh, defiantly says our forces are much beyond your conception. We're prepared to fight. They're outnumbered several times over. And the main thing Durnford is hoping to do is to buy time for a relief force out of Pensacola to come. And they do come and they arrive just outside of Mobile, just in time for to see that the final bombardment, which was opened on March 14, 1780, had utterly put <laughs> destroyed some of the, the walls of, of uh, Fort Charlotte and the British were compelled to surrender. Uh, it's, it's a major triumph for Galvez to now take a major uh, city in, in a whole region in West Florida. But it's not exactly huge numbers as far as casualties. This was this is we're all away from from major casualty figures, but it was a a, a really a big step towards the takeover of West Florida. Now, obviously, the one thing he's got left to do is to capture the colonial capital, Pensacola. That's his next goal. But something happens before he can do that, which is another chapter in the story that I don't think many people know of, and I particularly 
intrigued by it because it occurred right here in, in my back door. Um, there was a little place that's a forerunner of Daphne, uh, Daphne, Alabama, that was called the Village, a little settlement on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay. And when Galvez had captured Mobile, he goes back to New Orleans. He needs to raise another army, get ready for an attack on Pensacola. He leaves a small fortification there um, at, at the village under the command of, of, of uh, uh, Espolita. And he's got about 150, nearly 200 people in it at, at its largest point. And that post is supposed to help them solidify control of Mobile and watch in case the British do anything uh, to, that would interfere with this next campaign that's coming against Pensacola. Well, the British did something. They not only encouraged the Choctaws who were allied with them to, to make periodic attacks in the area, they planned their surprise attack of their own, which they hoped would change the momentum in the war and that maybe they could go back and they could capture Mobile or recapture it and then maybe reverse some of these losses they had already experienced. So they they um, the, the fortification at the village, we do not know exactly its location. It's roughly in the area where I-10 runs between Spanish Fort and Daphne. Um, but we don't know the exact spot, but we know um, we know a lot about the story that unfolded there. And what happens, the British sent a combined military force. It ships into the bay to cut off any any Spanish um, reinforcements from Mobile. Had an army come from Pensacola. And on uh, at dawn, on a very foggy January morning, January 7th, 1781, they, they attacked this place by surprise. And they almost completely overwhelm it uh, before the Spanish finally are able to make a make organized defense and part of that defense in those first few minutes they actually uh, shoot down some of the leaders of the attack and the, the attack kind of loses momentum loses leadership and the end of the day after after an extended period of pretty fierce fighting um, and, and and some of the largest casualties in any of these campaigns we're discussing here as you see on the screen the Spanish had actually repulsed that attack and so while the Spaniards are, are you know, exultant in, in their victory, confident in themselves, the British are left to retreat to Pensacola where everybody knows this is now going to be the final scene of this, this campaign. Galvez gets his army in motion shortly after this, this affair. This combined forces operation is ultimately going to have, um, he had nearly 4,000 men involved, and he ultimately is going to be assisted by some French forces later on in the siege it's several months it's in march to, to may when this is going to play out and it's going to end up being the largest battle that's ever fought in the state of florida this was a major operation even for those times because he will into eventually have about seven thousand nearly eight thousand men under arms attacking this british outpost and it's several outposts not just one galvez of course heads into pensacola bay in march 1781 He's got a, a he's got his small fleet. Then he's got another uh, uh, Spanish fleet. Spanish fleet that's part of the navy says you know we're, we're unsure where the the depth of the water in some of these places. We're unsure where the fortifications are. We don't want to just sail in there blindly and get routed. We need some caution. Galvez says there's no time to waste. We've got to do this now. And he says if you won't do it, I'll do it with my own fleet. So he takes his own three ships. I alone, yo solo goes into Pensacola Bay, initiates the campaign. The rest of the Navy is shamed into following him in. This is his coat of arms, and I'm circled on there where they added to that coat of arms that 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 depiction of him on, on his his flagship with a, I know you can't read the little banner up top, but up top it says, Yo Solo, I alone. So he's, he's memorialized for that action. And he launches into this prolonged siege that that takes place between uh, March and May, and it's for several several fortifications because Pensacola is the best defended place in the whole colony. It's not just one fort; it's several, and you'll see where those were superimposed on a map of modern Pensacola. Um, the the Spanish are eventually just getting closer and closer uh, to these these uh, British fortifications, and the end up it just ends all of a sudden. Uh, in uh, May 8, 1781, when the, in the routine of firing on each other, a Spanish mortar shell is launched and just happens to go right into the powder magazine of the Queen's Redoubt, blows it to pieces, kills a hundred guys or so, and uh, it, it just rendered defense, further defense, almost impossible. And, and the, the siege of Pensacola was effectively over. They signed the agreement 
uh, the, the uh, capitulation agreement a day or two later, and Pensacola fell. And so every major installation in British West Florida had been captured by arms by Galvez. There's a statue of him. If you've been to Pensacola today, there's a equestrian statue. And on the panels around this thing, all these battles I'm telling you about, they, there's some summaries of them. So that's how we get from British West Florida being conceived and founded and developed to becoming Spanish West Florida. And it's going to be Spanish West Florida, of course, from the time the Spanish took over all the way until its piecemeal acquisition by the United States in 1810 and in 1813, where we're sitting during the, during the War of 1812, that, that this portion of Alabama was finally, um, uh, this of West Florida was ceded to the United States. Um, I want to mention real quickly as I wrap up here, though, that that border that I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation is going to play a factor in, in, um, in Alabama's development in, in a unique way. Remember that first border that, that was established in 1763 was 31st parallel. British decided to move it up. And then when Spain took over, they said, well, we're going to observe the same borders the British did. And the United States said, well, our treaty that ended the, the Revolutionary War says the boundary between that colony is now the 31st parallel. So they're a little bit of a diplomatic issue that is a, is a significant issue, but not one that Americans are prepared to go to war about anytime soon. And it sort of festers for over a decade until finally the Treaty of San Lorenzo in 1795, that disputed area that you see with the check marks there in basically South Alabama and South Mississippi. Finally, Spain agrees that, yeah, they would withdraw from there down to the 31st parallel. All of that's going to become United States property. It's immediately annexed into the United States in 1798 as the Mississippi Territory. That's the beginning of, our, of any U.S. control of any portion of what is Alabama. So that's how we get full circle from the British colony of West Florida being founded uh, 1763 to being taken over by the Spanish and ultimately that border dispute that's going to lead to the establishment of the American territory and portion of it. I appreciate your attention. I hope that you've uh, learned a little bit about West Florida and I'll be glad to take any questions that I can. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the uh, presentation. And and if you just submit your questions, submit your questions and uh, then we'll be able to we'll be able to answer them directly. Directly. I actually had a question. Had a question. Start with. Start with. So, so back to, back to right after the after the are these people are these people that have been growing, growing, growing? Sorry, I think that there's a lot. I think that there's a little bit for that for that. Uh, so so with with them reverting back to Spain, back to Spain, it, that people are staying there. There's more staying. Others are staying. Okay, your some of your audio is cutting in and out again, but uh, I think you're asking, did they stay? Did the, the settlers stay? At, yeah, um, for the most part, they did. Um, there were certainly some some uh, people that did move elsewhere, and I, I should mention, going back to the establishment of the colony, when when um, the 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 French were offered the opportunity to stay in Mobile. Most did end up taking that oath of allegiance, whereas in Pensacola, um, before they had even that opportunity, the, the home government said, we'll, we'll gladly take you to, to another colony, to, to Mexico, if you'd like. And most people took advantage of that. Um, but after the after this war, uh, by and large, most people did stay. And it's not so much that they they were really believers in the Spanish as much as where are they going to go? You know, uh, they had already set up their homes and farms and plantations. And so there's a lot of these places that simply just took an oath to another country and continued on their business, which goes back to my point about loyalties in the revolution. Uh, we, we tend to think of everything being this, this strong, uh, idealistic struggle everywhere. And in this area where you saw very little presence of government at all in most circumstances, um, there was a great 
uh, ability and willingness to kind of go with the flow and see what comes next. And again, I'm oversimplifying. There were certainly instances of people who who left or came for various reasons. But a lot of people um, realized that Spanish government would probably be pretty lax. They offered uh, people uh, they could still worship as they pleased and in private, at least. Um, They offered uh, relatively little government uh, influence and things at all. And all things considered, um, I I think William Dunbar even said it, uh, that, that Spanish colonial government in West Florida was almost the same as no government at all. And he didn't mean that as it's chaos. It just means that there was very little presence. So these are people that when presented with that opportunity uh, seemed to, that continuing on where they were was as good an option as they may have had. So a lot of people did stay. Perfect. OK, so hopefully I'm going to be coming through a little bit better right now. But um, we also have some audience questions, so I'm going to be sharing them so you can actually read them uh, in case my audio is not uh, doing well. We'll look on my screen. So Catherine Braun, can you tell us about the painting of the farm on Massacre Island? I can't tell you much more about it. Um, I, I, I know it's uh, it's supposed to be a, it's a, it's a small farm on Dolphin Island. I do not know a great deal more about its story. We have from Diane Fluker, uh, when does the trading company Panton and Leslie come to play? British traders under the Spanish government. Yeah, that comes into play not that long after the end of the war. Spain was attempting to continue to supply the Native Americans with trade goods that they needed. And Spain was bluntly not able to provide the quality or quantity through their connections that that they needed. And I I, I don't recall the exact year. It may have been as early as 1784. Somebody probably correct me on that. But um, very early they start contracting with British firms who have the ability to, to acquire what they need. And that's where you begin Patton and Leslie growing into this major commercial enterprise, which takes over trading for a huge swath of the Southeast and is going to grow in influence in the next decade or two. But it, it's shortly after the Spanish take over. Uh, it definitely is. Um, and I'm, can you hear me better right now? Perfect. Mm-hmm. It, it's uh I've done a little work on the Panton Leslie company, and so it, you're exactly right. It's around 1784, but they are kind of coming in unofficially before then. Uh, but that's kind of when the Spanish start to actually allow them um, kind of official uh, space in their in their economy. So, but that's a wonderful question from Diane. Uh, we have another great one here from Claire Wilson. Did the laws of the two nations differ significantly? Did that affect the daily lives of the colonists much? Uh, Paying a very broad brush here, not major differences as far as day to day life. Um, there were certainly certainly some differences, but it, it wasn't like a wholesale change in, in what you were doing from one administration to the other, which, again, is one of the reasons it was relatively easy to stay um, on and continue your, your plantation, your, your farm, your operation. Um, I don't know all the the the. Uh, of, of the Spanish law, but I, but I know that that the general reaction that most people seem to have was that well, whatever whatever the British were requiring, the Spanish needs seem to require even less. Now that's a really really glossy overview, a big picture description. But but no, I, I'm not aware of any just you know dramatic changes that were going to force an adjustment that that people were unwilling to make. Excellent. We have another great one here from Marty Olaf. Mike, did you rely much on the work of Robert Ray and or Robin Fable? Oh, definitely. Um, Dr. Fable would actually actually review the final manuscript um, and, and, and uh, help me with uh, with getting everything ready. And of course, uh, I've got everything that Dr. Ray wrote. Um, really, the pioneers of research in, into this this topic. In, in Alabama's colonial history. And so, yeah, I, I, I utilize them extensively. Excellent. We have time for a few more. We have one here from Amy uh, Billerbeck. In terms of the population, what areas of the colony were they coming from? Do you mean where the, the, the settlers that are coming to West Florida, that where, where are they coming from? I believe um, so. Yeah, they're coming from other British colonies, but they're also coming from 
other uh, Brit well, British colonies across the board, not just not just the North American seaboard co colonies. There are people who are coming from what we know and now as New England. There's a lot of people from Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, of course, uh, Georgia and the Carolinas. But you have people from the West Indies. You even have a small number of people who are coming directly from Europe. Uh, during the during the time period, you got a small group of Germans and people from other other European countries. Not not a major rush or anything, but short answers are coming from all over. Uh, but just like they would in later periods, those uh, southern colonies, North South South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, that, that's where a, a good many of those first settlers are coming from. And this is a kind of a, a good one that maybe can help round it out. Um, didn't come up here. Here we go. Mr. Bunn, why do you think this is part of our history? That this part of our history isn't taught in school. Why do we not focus on this in school? We don't know about it. <laughs> um, we just, you know, t teachers, uh, j just like everybody else, they, they know to teach the history that they they're familiar with. And I would I would suggest that it's just simply, you know, if you learn American, we taught American history, you know, all about the 13 colonies and you're not as aware, aware of all these other little stories that are out there. And this is one of those interesting little stories. I just don't think people are aware as much to, to even know to teach it. I don't think they're consciously ignoring it. I just don't think it's widely known because I mean, everybody I've encountered when I've done this with teacher workshops and we did a curriculum guide here in Baldwin County that talked a little bit about some of this. Um, it's all been embraced. And, and I think it's just just a general awareness that we do have a connection with the revolutionary era that a lot of people just are totally unaware of. And I will admit when I started this, I barely knew the details of it myself. So I can understand how it's easily overlooked. But I think it's a really intriguing chapter in local history and kind of connects us with some broader national events in, in a way that we may might not have thought of previously. And for that alone, I think it's really worth worth knowing about and, and teaching. Definitely coming up in the relatively near future is the 250th uh, anniversary of the United States. So it's kind of a, a way to bring in also that Alabama has a part in that history. Um, not not much that we we have focused on before, but that there is kind of a story here. Um, and one final question here. Uh, other resources besides your own book, what would you suggest to help us discover more about this time period? Uh, the, the writings of the two uh, gentlemen who were mentioned, who Marty mentioned, Robert Ray, he published several articles in the Alabama Review or Alabama Historical Quarterly, maybe. I, I know some in the Review over the years. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Fable ha has a biography on George Johnstone, and he's got a book about um, uh, the economy of British West Florida. I think that's the title of it, and discusses the economics of the colony. Um, those, those are your first two sources, and they will lead you everywhere else there is to go and be prepared. There are not tons of other places to go. This isn't like Civil War literature with a with a book a week coming out on the topic. Um, this is something that there's a relatively limited amount of literature, but those are, you know, th those are the two guys to, to, to look for to start with. Definitely. And can I also suggest um, Colin Calloway's book on uh, the American Revolution and in Indian Nation? Uh, he he does a great one. It's kind of shows another flip side. Another kind of part of the story that we don't even hear about a lot is what's happening in that kind of creek interior. What's happening uh, amongst uh, the the creek and the Cherokee and and all the different Native American nations um, during the Revolutionary period, which is another kind of fascinating chapter. Yeah, it's a whole whole story unto itself. And and like I say in the book, my my goal here is to discuss. It's, it's ironic that in some ways. I would suggest that we probably have more scholarship on what was going on among the Native Americans in this period than we do from the people who are who are attempting to establish this colony. So I wanted to say what what exactly was British West Florida? What were they doing? But there's a lot of interaction with the rest of what's happening in the interior. That's a that's a whole other area for discovery. So yeah, I, I agree completely. Exactly, whole other area, but. I think that one place that you can definitely start, Missy, is with uh, Mike's book. And again, you can get it here uh, at the archives, but it's a great place to kind of start to, to get the story of what's happening in West Florida. So thank you so much. And 
Uh, I think that's where we're going to start. We have a few more people coming in, but I think that's going to be um, all the questions that we have time for today. But thank you so much for being our very first lecture of 2021. And to everyone, I hope to see you back here next month on February 18th for Dr. Hillary Green's presentation. Thank you all. Thank you.